Today I want to speak to you on the subject of seven ways to spot and identify a false teacher. Uh, I've had some questions that have come in recently, one that came in yesterday that really kind of uh, led to the preparation of the study that we're going to share with you today. And it was a young Christian who had found Christ through our YouTube ministry and they said, I begin listening to you and I'm trying to learn the Bible and I find myself listening to some others and some of them I'm concerned about. It doesn't sound like they're teaching the same Bible truths that you're teaching. How do I know as a new Christian if I'm listening to somebody who can be trusted or if I'm listening to someone who is a false teacher or a false prophet and so on? Uh, you have heard me say oftentimes, and I say it I hope with humility, but I sincerely would like to be a trusted voice in your life for understanding Bible prophecy and Bible questions and theology as you grow in the knowledge of the Word. Uh, I would hope, and it's not always the case because in various parts of the world not everybody has access to a Bible-believing church or a godly pastor, but I would hope that the number one trusted voice you have is your pastor. Uh, at minimum, they should be a trusted voice of an individual that you submit to and you listen and you learn and you grow from their teaching and from their preaching of Bible truths. But today, I want to answer that question because I'm certain that there are many people who probably have never been taken into the Bible. Because you see, I'm not going to give you my opinions and I'm not going to give you some uh, relevant advice and I'm not going to try to be a spiritual father just speaking from my own thoughts on this. As always, if you're a new student of our channel, we start in the Bible, we stay in the Bible, and we finish in the Bible. And I actually, as I was preparing for this, I wrote down a list of 22 ways to identify and to spot false teachers and false prophets. But because of the sake of time, I want to give you seven. And so if you're taking notes, seven ways to spot a false teacher. And I hope that you'll follow along and write these things down. I'm reading today out of 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 1. And as I often do, I'm going to read a lengthy passage because uh, I'm a strong believer of text within context and I want you to have the full context of this. And uh, let's begin at verse 1. But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. Pause right there. False teachers, false prophets is not something new in the 21st century. It's been around from the very beginning of spiritual time. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction upon themselves. Pause right there. If you listen to false teaching and false prophets, you are sowing seeds of self-destruction in your spiritual life and oftentimes in many avenues of life. There is power in the Bible being taught properly. And sadly, there are consequences of listening to the Bible being taught improperly. Verse 2, many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get a hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness, where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment 
So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. But the angels, who are far greater in power and strength, do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against those supernatural beings. These false teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things they do not understand, and like animals, they will be destroyed. Their destruction is their reward for the harm they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. They are a disgrace and a stain among you. They delight in deception, even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. They commit adultery with their eyes, and their desire for sin is never satisfied. They lure unstable people into sin, and they are well trained in greed. They live under God's curse. They have wandered off the right road and have followed the footsteps of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong. But Balaam was stopped from his mad course when his donkey rebuked him with a human voice. These people are as useless as dried up springs or as mist blown away by the wind. They are doomed to blackest darkness. They brag about themselves with empty, foolish boasting, with an appeal to twisted sexual desires. They lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from a lifestyle of deception. They promise freedom but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption, for you are a slave to whatever controls you. As we enter into this Bible study, seven ways how you can spot a false teacher, let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we again bow before you each and every day. May we never forget and may we be continually aware that you're holy and we depend upon you for everything that we have. Every good and perfect gift comes from your gracious hand and we praise you. We humble our hearts once again in your holy presence and before this audience of people who will open the Bible with us and begin to learn truths and in this case, specific warnings that you gave that like guardrails will keep us safe on the highway of everlasting truth. I pray, Father, that not one person within the sound of my voice will suffer under the deception of false teachers and false prophets. And I pray that through the word of God today, you'll help me to communicate to them the ways that they can safeguard their very souls. I pray specifically for those who may be listening, who may not be sure as to whether they have a genuine and a right relationship with God. I pray that you'd give them the faith and the courage and also the patience for at the end of this time of study, 
We look forward to praying with those who perhaps have never made peace with God. Let today be the day that they turn from sin, turn to Christ, and begin living every day ready for the Lord's promised and soon return. And we pray and ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, uh, big amen. Uh, throughout the history of the church, Christianity has been plagued by countless and continual impostors and charlatans and false teachers that sadly lead a lot of people astray. Uh, Jesus in the Bible in uh, Matthew chapter 24 uh, warned us in what is oftentimes called uh, the Olivet Discourse that false teachers and false prophets would actually increase as a sign of the last days and that they would become more prevalent than ever before. Now, I've often wondered, because as a student of Bible prophecy and I teach on eschatology and Bible prophecy in the end times, uh, those of you that follow us, we teach on that all the time. It's one of the things that I uh, really feel is most important because we're living in the end times. But I've often wondered, is it possible that social media has become a part of the fulfillment of this warning from Jesus in the Olivet Discourse that false teachers, false prophets, false ministries would become incredibly prevalent in the last days. And social media has allowed anyone with a smartphone or simple equipment uh, to call themselves a minister, to call themselves a teacher, to call themselves a pastor, to call themselves an apostle or a prophet, and so on. And People sometimes never validate that. They just scroll and listen. Uh, I can't imagine the number of videos that people forward to me to listen to. And uh, to save you a little trouble, if I don't intimately know the individual that's speaking, I just simply delete those videos. I personally have a handful of people that God has brought into my life that are trusted sources when it comes to reading, learning, living, loving, and applying the Bible to my life. I don't have a long list of people that I trust. I personally have a very short list, and you should too, because not everybody who calls themselves a true minister is indeed. Uh, in Matthew 24, verses 10 through 12, in that Olivet Discourse, here's what Jesus said. He said, many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. Now, this might be painful, but you can't accuse me of not loving you enough to look you in the eyes and tell you the truth. Social media is rife with false teachers who masquerade under the banner of Christianity and you need to be overly cautious as to who you listen to. Because without the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, John, I believe it's in the 16th chapter, told us that the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible tells us that God gave specific ministry gifts to the church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. Between the help and the tutoring of the Holy Spirit and tenured proven ministry gifts, God has a way of guiding us into truth. And so we shouldn't be careless and flippant about who we listen to because if we do, we will be vulnerable and open ourselves up to deception in the last days. I do want to say, there is coming a day of judgment. And the Bible said, not all who call me Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom. There is coming a day of judgment for every imposter, for everyone who masquerades under the banner of Christianity, 
for every false teacher, for every false prophet, they will stand before God on a day of judgment and hear, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Communicating the truth of God is sacred and serious business and should never be taken lightly. Uh, with that said, in a world of deception, how do we identify false teachers and false prophets? Let me give you seven. Seven ways to spot a false teacher. If you're taking notes, number one, the Bible told us in our text by the Apostle Peter, I read verses 1 through 19 in that passage. In verse 1, he told us they will deny the work of Jesus. One of the signs of a false prophet is they do not give spotlight and attention and priority to the work of Jesus Christ. And the question needs to be asked, what is the work of Christ? Well, in essence, don't miss this, in essence, the greatest work of Christ Jesus is His work on the cross. Through the cross, Jesus willingly laid His life down, shed His blood, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, who alone could pay the price for my sin and for your sin. Upon the cross, Jesus Christ broke the curse of sin and sickness and lack, and by that ultimate sacrifice upon the cross, Jesus accomplished His greatest work. The finished work of the cross is the true foundation of His present work and also His future work. False teachers, almost without exception, never put a spotlight upon the message of the cross. They rarely talk about Christ and the cross and His resurrection and what that entails. A crucified Savior dying for the real sins of real people is not a popular message. And uh, you never hear me speak that eventually I make clear the message of the cross, and I'll do so today. If you're listening to me today for the first time, or you're not sure where you stand with God, my priority is to help men and women and boys and girls find their way to right relationship with God. And Acts tells us, neither is there salvation. Chapter 4, verse 12 of the book of Acts. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And before I'm done today, if you need to make peace with God, I'd like to have the privilege of praying with you. Uh, this is not a prayer about becoming involved in some type of denomination, and I'm not being critical, but I'm just telling you, I'm not asking you today to become a Protestant or a Catholic or a Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist or so on. I'm asking you, do you have genuinely a right relationship with God? Are you living in victory over sin, or is sin living in victory over you? The true message of Christ and the cross makes us face our selfish and our sinful nature. The message of Christ requires us to take up a cross, to deny ourselves, and to follow Him, and to live for Him as He died for us. False teachers usually, quite frequently, focus upon a gospel of ease and enjoyment. They focus upon a life of blessings and breakthroughs. But rarely do they teach and preach the cross, dying unto self. John chapter 3 said, He, Jesus, must increase, I must decrease. The true message of the cross is not self-promotion. It is self-sacrifice. It is dying to self and raising up in newness of life to serve Christ and His eternal cause. Their teaching always appeals to usually vulnerable people that are seeking just enough religion to soothe the guilt 
of their sins that they feel, but not enough to satisfy the requirements of a holy God and save their souls. Uh, Paul the Apostle uh, wrote almost a third of the New Testament. Uh, his letters are called the Pauline Epistles uh, in theology courses. And in the book of Galatians, uh, and the sixth chapter and the 14th verse, Paul said, As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. So when you're listening to a teacher or a pastor or an evangelist or a prophet or someone claiming to be involved in ministry, ask yourself this question. Is the purity of the gospel being preached? And is there a clear and frequent call to recognize your sin, to repent of your sin, and to receive Jesus Christ. Test number one to spot a false teacher is they ignore or rarely speak about the essence of the message of Christ and the cross. Number two, the Bible tells us in verse two, Peter said they teach false doctrine. False teachers oftentimes are pitiful in their scholarship of the Bible. And you listen to them, and if you listen to them for 40 minutes, you're going to hear 35 minutes of their personal commentary, almost none of which is rooted and founded in Scripture. It sounds good. It's pleasing to the ear. That's what the Bible meant when it talked about people who had itching ears that needed to be satisfied. It's vitally important that the ministries that you listen to have a history of proper scholarship. Now let me define that and put a little meat on that bone for you because a Bible college education or a seminary education is valuable and uh, obviously serving uh, in a lead position at a Bible college and seminary currently, I value that. I think there is much to be said for those who feel called to ministry to set apart a period of time, whether it be in a proper Bible college or in a historic seminary, and prepare themselves to rightly divide the word of truth. I have great value that I put upon that, but I'll also go as far as to say that is not always a guarantee that the individual has a continued consecration to a lifetime of study and to a lifetime of scholarship. Also, beware of false degrees. Beware of ministries who put an emphasis upon a degree that they've never earned. Uh, if someone has an earned doctorate, there's nothing wrong with advertising that. Uh, the proper protocol for an honorary doctorate is you're not supposed to advertise an honorary doctorate. Uh, it can be used in resumes, but in the academic world, an honorary degree is not equal to an earned doctorate. So always beware of people who claim to have false degrees. Because if they do not have an earned degree, let's just be really honest here, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I want to be blunt and honest with you because this is oftentimes one of the ways that I can always spot a false ministry, a false teacher, or a ministry that's absent in the areas of character and integrity. For example, I recently heard of a minister at a church with a minister that I know very well, and that individual said, I have four earned doctorates. Well, as soon as I heard that, my involvement in the academic world over the last several years around people that have earned doctorates and earned PhDs, rarely do people have the time or the money to have four earned doctorates, not to mention a lot of that would be an exercise in futility and repetition. 
because an earned doctorate is a substantial portion of life and money. So I did a little homework on the internet. And that individual who claimed to have four earned doctorates didn't have one single earned doctorate. All of his supposed doctorates were from an establishment where doctorates were given out like peppermint candy at Christmas. And there was not an accredited institution that backed his claims of education. Now let me take this one step further. There are people who claim that their degrees are accredited, but the institution they claim is accredited is not accredited. And there are ways to see if someone is really holding an earned degree. Now why would I put an emphasis upon that? Because when people claim to have a false level of education or a false level of degree or certification, it's proof number one that they're comfortable with lying. It's proof number two that they're comfortable with deceiving their audience. It's proof number three that they're an individual who is deceiving and practices deception. And I could go on and on all of which are not Christ-like characteristics, all of which people who have ministry integrity and can be trusted would never wade into either the shallow or the deep end of that pool of false credential. It is a very serious thing to claim academic credentials that a person does not genuinely have. You can go into Christian magazines and go on the very back and for a small amount of money and a small amount of time, you can get a doctorate degree from some institution that's nothing more. They're called in the world of academia paper mills because all they do is hand you a piece of paper with a false title on it and really godly men and really godly women don't need somebody's foolish masqueraded title to be applied to their name for credential. The Bible said your gift will make room for you, not necessarily your degree. So one of the ways to spot false teachers and false prophets is beware if they hang a hat upon a degree that's not valid, not accredited, and they have not earned. Now there might be some that'll listen to me and you're guilty of this. I want to extend grace to you. Because some of you have done this because you've seen so many people in the Christian world who have done it and you've just followed suit thinking that's a good policy. Well, from today forward, you no longer have the right to say, I didn't know better. Today, you know better. And if you're advertising a false degree or a degree that's not accredited or earned, you should discard that from promotion. I have an honorary doctorate. You've never seen me mention it. You've never seen me advertise it. I've never put it on one single piece of advertising or paper. Now, many churches that I've gone to, when I've arrived, I have found that they have advertised, speaking this week, Dr. Tiff Shuttlesworth. I have always, 100% of the time, said don't ever put doctor in front of my name again until I have one that's earned. I'm just currently finishing an earned master's degree, I certainly would never take an honorary doctorate and place it in front of my name because in the academic world, that is proof that there is an absent of academic integrity. And you can mark false prophets and false teachers by people who claim to have educational prowess that they do not have. Also, beware of new believers. The Bible doesn't allow new believers to be teachers and apostles and evangelists and prophets. If someone has only been saved for a year or three years or five years, I certainly would consider that person a new believer. Do you realize that God didn't even allow Jesus to enter ministry until he was 30 years old? Because that was an accepted age in the days of Christ and prior to Christ. Moses was 30 before he was promoted in his ministry. Joshua was 30. David was 30. Jesus was 30 and so on. I could give many examples of that because that was the protocol of Judaism. You were bar mitzvahed 
as a teenage boy, but you weren't allowed to speak in open discussion with the elders of your community until the age of 30. Now, I'm, I'm not saying, listen carefully, I'm not saying someone cannot be a senior pastor until they're 30 years old or older, but I would hope that they have been well supported by some type of apostolic leadership as they guide them through the infancy of their ministry. You say, well, I don't know that that's in the Bible. Of course it's in the Bible. I would never teach you something that couldn't be supported with Scripture. Paul told Timothy in his first letter, in the third chapter, in the sixth verse, he said, a church leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. It takes time to develop sound, proper, biblical scholarship and the skill to handle the Word of God with proper application. Number three, seven ways to identify a false teacher. Number three, the Bible said in verses three through nine, beware of people that are greedy for money. Greed has been the downfall of many spiritual leaders. Spiritual leaders in the Bible are often warned against the dangers of sexual immorality, pride, and greed. Sexual immorality, pride, and greed. Those three are linked together in the scriptures for very sound reason. And we should never forget the trap of being greedy for money. Beware of ministries that promise promotion and prosperity without precursors. Write that down. Solid gold for identifying false teachers and prophets. Beware of any ministry, any teacher, any prophet, any apostle, any evangelist, any pastor that promises promotion and prosperity without precursors. What does that mean? If you've been a Christian for any amount of time at all and you've seen ministries on social media, by now I'm sure you've seen somebody who has declared that I prophesy and decree that the month of, and whatever the month is, insert the name of the month, whatever this month is, the Lord told me this is a month of promotion and prosperity. The fact that they would declare that to the totality of their audience without understanding how those people are living before a holy God is proof that their money ministry is misaligned with the integrity of the scriptures. You can't promise an audience of people promotion. You can't promise an audience of people prosperity if you don't know how they're living. Because people who are promised God's favor or blessing without knowing what the relationship those individuals have with God, are perverting the holiness of the favor and the advancement and the promotion and the blessing of God. People in your audience that are living in sin, living in sexual immorality, living with a man or a woman outside of the holy bounds of marriage, people that are lazy, people who are addicted to pornography, people who are dishonest in their business, and I could go on, people who are living outside of the boundaries of righteousness and holiness will never experience God's blessing. Psalm 84, 11, no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. Righteousness and integrity and character are the backbones of promotion, blessing, and prosperity. And don't get me wrong, I believe in the favor of God. I live by the favor of God. Lost Lamb Association, we're not a church. I have no congregation to make an appeal to every Sunday morning. I have to trust God for His provision, and He faithfully provides. And if you were to be a subscriber to our YouTube channel, I think as I speak, as this one will be uploaded to the YouTube and podcast channel, I think we're getting close to 300 Bible studies that are available to you on YouTube and on podcast. Do you know how many of those 
have content where I ask for money? Not a single one. Not because it's wrong. It's not wrong for a ministry to ask for money. But my primary audience is unsaved and unreached people. And because I have such a sensitivity in my spirit about that, and I'm not saying this is for everyone. I'm just saying my conviction. My conviction is I say little to nothing about money and finances because I don't want anyone without Christ that I'm trying to reach to feel like I'm after anything other than their eternal address and their decision to turn from sin and turn to Christ. Again, it's not wrong to ask for money. Jesus taught about money. The apostles talked about money. Paul took offerings. Paul took special offerings. But when ministries put an overemphasis on money and they take a truth in the Bible and make it the truth of the Bible and they do it in ways that are not biblical, then you know you're listening to a false teacher or a false prophet. They're greedy for money. And if their greed for money is reflected with arrogance and, and uh, attitudes of things in this world and the cares of this life and things that are temporary, again, they're miscued with the eternal value of the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God does bless us in this life. It is impossible. Listen, it is impossible to turn from sin and turn to Christ without your life beginning to move forward and upward all the days of your life. God will advance your life when you live righteously and you follow His commandments and you submit to His teachings. God will bless you. God will advance you. God will promote you. He said, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and I will lift you up. The message of the gospel is a lifting gospel. I am not attacking blessing. I am not attacking favor. I am not attacking prosperity. I live by the gracious hand of God. I am not attacking those things. But I am telling you, when people just make vast generalized prophecies to an incredible audience where they have no precursors as to how those people are living and promise prosperity and advancement and breakthrough, and if you sow a thousand dollar seed, God spoke to me that 12 of you will be millionaires in the next six months. And Things that I've heard like that are obscene when you bring it into the standard of the Bible. Nor can you buy healing. For those who sow $100 on the seventh day of this month, the Lord told me because you're sowing a seed on the seventh day that He's going to release healing in your body for miracles. You can't buy healing. Beware of ministries who promise prosperity and breakthrough without any pre cursors. Number four, false teachers, false prophets despise authority. We see this in verse 10. Beware of ministries that have no reference to authority that they're being submissive to. For example, do they have a pastor that can speak on their behalf and attest their character. Uh, I have just come off of the road and been involved in multiple services in, in 10 days and, and travel. And, uh, but you know what? And I'm not saying this in pride. I'm saying this as an example of what I'm teaching. Every Sunday that I'm home, my wife and I get up and get ready and go to church. Every Sunday I'm home. doesn't matter how tired I am. It doesn't matter if I've had 23 services in the last 17 days. It would be very easy for me to say, well, nobody goes to church more than I do. God saw I had 23 services in 17 days. He doesn't mind if I take this Sunday off. I'm not saying that he would condemn somebody that said that. I'm just telling you, because I believe in authority and because I believe in submission to authority, I have a pastor who is my pastor. When I'm with him, he's a dear friend of mine, but I call him pastor. I bless my pastor. I honor my pastor. 
I am faithful to the house of God every Sunday morning when I'm home. We always pay our tithe. We always support any special effort the church is doing and special offerings. We want to model that which would be pleasing in the eyes of God as a spiritual leader, as a minister, as an evangelist. You could call my pastor and you would find that he would validate my ministry. As a matter of fact, he is away this coming Sunday and he called me some time ago and said, I'll be away on this Sunday would you please fill my pulpit on Sunday morning? There is no higher accountability proof that when a pastor turns the sacred desk over to a ministry, that's a pastor's way of saying, I endorse this ministry. I trust this ministry. I know that they rightly divide the word of truth. I entrust my congregation to this ministry. What about the people you're listening to? Do they have a pastor? Do they attend church faithfully? Are they faithful tithers? Are they sacrificially participating in the ministry of their church? And what about spiritual authority on a higher level? Have they submitted to someone to receive a ministerial license or a ministerial ordina ordination or are they rogue? They're not submissive to any type of of spiritual authority that would call them into account if they were teaching false doctrine or if they were living in sexual sin or immoral, involved in financial scandal. They have no one that they're accountable to. That, my friend, is one of the major blinking red lights of a false prophet or a false teacher. What about fiscal authority? Do they have financial authority? Uh, many of you have heard me say through the years, one of my heroes is Dr. Billy Graham. And I studied the fiscal authority of the Billy Graham organization. And listen, my name is not worthy of breathe, being breathed in the same sentence with Billy Graham. But I, as Paul told Timothy, follow me as I follow Christ. I have tried to follow a hero in the faith because he followed Christ. And in particular, I analyze the fiscal integrity of their ministry. I do my best to bring those same levels of fiscal integrity into Lost Lamb Association. If you were to look Lost Lamb Association up on Charity Navigator, which is an independent organization that grades ministries on fiscal integrity and other measures of integrity, we currently have a 94 out of 100. And I don't say that in boasting. I'm just saying there are outside agencies that police the integrity of ministries. What about the people you're listening to? Do they pass fiscal integrity? I'm on a set salary controlled by a board of trustees. I think the last report that came out from Charity Navigator, 88 cents out of every dollar given to Lost Lamb Association is used for its vision statement and intended purpose. Now, obviously, we have staff and we have ministry expenses and cameras and media equipment and on and on and on. There's always a measure that has to be used to cover the expenses of living in a real world with rising costs. But 88 cents out of every dollar, 89 cents, I don't remember what it was, is being used for our vision statement and intended message, which is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You should do your homework on ministries that you listen to. Let me give you a classic example. If you as a Christian support a ministry who solicited money from you on Facebook or on social media that you've never met, and it happens all the time. I'm sure you get them. I get them by the scores. Oftentimes, ministries from the Middle East and they either have an orphanage or they're feeding the poor or they're doing crusades or they're building churches or, or, or placing wells or helping the sick. And they appeal to you through social media and they even validate it with pictures. If you support a ministry that you don't know or your pastor doesn't recognize or bless, you have proven to God that you cannot be trusted with the promotion of financial favor with God because the vast majority of people who solicit money 
on social media are scams. Pictures are not proof. And I've been overseas. I've held ministry outreaches in 56 countries of the world. I've seen these people. They buy a couple of bags of rice. They gather up children. They even pay people at orphanages. And they'll go in and take pictures and pretend they're feeding or a church or a hospital, et cetera, et cetera. If you support a ministry overseas that you don't know, you can't validate. You as a Christian have proven to God that you cannot be trusted with financial promotion because you're not wise. The Bible says, know those who labor among you. You should strive to know a ministry that you trust and listen to and check out those areas of authority, spiritual authority, pastoral authority, and fiscal authority, they should pass all three of those tests with flying colors. Number five, they're proud and arrogant. Verse 10, you can just tell. I don't have to spend a lot of time teaching this because God just inherently gave us as human beings, whether you're saved or not saved, all of us have this ability to discern pride and arrogance, and it's repulsive. But it is exceptionally repulsive when it's in a ministry gift. I'm just going to be honest with you. I cannot stand a ministry that exhibits pride and arrogance. They carry themselves as if they're a celebrity. They act as if they're a celebrity. They expect you to treat them as if they're a celebrity. They oftentimes surround themselves with entourages and pretend to be celebrities. They dress as if they're proud and arrogant. There's nothing wrong with dressing fine, but you know what I'm talking about. People who dress to such an extreme, an extreme. you know, the Bible says modesty is still the standard of God for His children and for His servants. There should be a modicum of modesty. In any man of God, any woman of God, there should not be pride and arrogance. And you know how you can tell? Their conversation is constantly filled with me, myself, I, and it's just prideful. I recently came across a young evangelist, and because I was once a young evangelist, there was a part of my heart that was tender for him. I actually cut a very generous check, four figures. And I was going to give it to that young man. And then, as I began to listen to him talk, his pride and his arrogance, he'll never know it. But I could not in good conscience sow a seed into pride and arrogance. And neither should you. Number six, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 18, 12, before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Number six, self-promotion. Peter covered that in verse 18. Be careful and be aware of ministries that are constantly self-promoting. And I, I want to be careful with this because there is a thin line. Hear me carefully. There is a thin line between using modern technology and social media to promote the gospel of Christ and biblical ministry or promoting yourself. Now, I want to be obedient to Paul's suggestion. Paul said, using all means available so that we might reach some. I want to use every technology available to me to help reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I do. And Lost Lamb is looking for ways to do a better job of reaching the world, utilizing modern technologies. But if you were to follow me on Twitter or on Facebook or on Instagram or any social media platform, feel free to private message me if you think I crossed this line. I'm willing to hold myself accountable to my audience. I don't spend a lot of time showing you pictures of me, uh, where I'm eating out, uh, the fancy design on my cappuccino, which 
I don't go to places that serve fancy cappuccinos. I love cappuccino. If they want to put a fancy design on it, fine. But I certainly don't feel I need to take a picture of that and show the world. I don't show pictures of myself much outside of ministry. Occasionally a family picture. Occasionally a picture of the grandkids. But there's a thin line between using social media to promote ministry and biblical ministry and self-promotion. Some ministries, I don't know where they find the time to post 10, 15, 20 times a day, and most of them are about themselves. I would consider that self-promotion. Lastly, false teachers, always an absence of holiness. Now, I'm not going to read the text again, but in all 19 verses that I read to you, Peter had an overriding theme. And that overriding theme was a promotion of self, a promotion of things temporary, an absence of things eternal, and an absence of the message of holiness. So I close with this. Please don't miss it. Beware of teachers and ministers and prophets and evangelists and so on. Beware of any ministry who never preaches or teaches on holiness or purity or consecration or repentance or righteous living. If you rarely, listen, if you rarely hear a ministry focused upon holiness and purity and consecration and repentance and righteous living, that should be a flashing red light. For Jesus said in Luke 13, unless you repent, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. It is impossible to preach the purity of the gospel and rip out its connection to holy living. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. 2 Corinthians, the Bible said if anybody comes to Christ, they become a brand new creature. Old things pass away and all things become new. A true minister of the gospel will always point you to the requirement of righteousness and holiness and consecration and purity. And ministries that never put an emphasis or rarely put an emphasis upon the holiness that Christ brings to a changed heart. I myself could never follow a ministry that doesn't have a strong core value that includes the holiness that Jesus Christ taught us. The Bible said that God is holy, and he said, Be ye also holy, for I am holy. You cannot be a true minister and never call people to recognize sin Never call people to repent of sin and never call people to receive Jesus Christ. I conclude with this. I know this is a tough teaching. I know for many uh, this will be hard to take. But I love you enough to tell you the truth. I do this because I want to safeguard your soul. I do this because of all of the questions and comments that are being sent in from many of you who have received Christ through the ministry of Lost Lamb, and you're sincerely and innocently asking, how do I tell the difference? Here are seven ways that you can spot a false teacher. And then always pray and say, Father, bring the right people into my life and take the wrong people out of my life and then be willing to allow God to do that. I told you that a true minister is not afraid to ask you to recognize your sin and repent of your sin and receive Jesus Christ. And so I have to ask you in closing, are you living a Christian life? Are you ready to meet the Lord? If Jesus Christ were to come tonight while you're sleeping, would you be ready to go? Are you living in victory over sin or is sin living in victory over you? I'd like to pray with you. And when we pray, when you're done, I want you to go to our website. It's on the screen, lostlamb.org, and click on New Beginnings and follow the easy prompts. 
And then write me an email and let me know that you prayed with me. I care about you. Our staff cares about you. We desire to help and follow up with you. But if you're not sure that you're right with God, some of you that will pray with me right now, it might be the first time you've ever personally received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Some of you might be backslidden away from God if you lost your way. You can come home. You can come home right now. Will you pray with me? Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. And down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I want to know all of my sin, all of my past is forgiven and forgotten and that I today am in right relationship with God. I recognize my sin. I repent of my sin. And now today in childlike faith, I receive Jesus Christ. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. I vow this day I will live for Jesus Christ. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the power to be what I ought to be in Jesus' name. Today I am no longer the property of sin. I am today a child of God and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen.